Welcome in, Jeff Cameron Show, 93.3 Real Talk Radio, War Chant TV, and here we go. We celebrate it every year, always love the opportunity to head up the conversation surrounding Florida State baseball going into the year. Opening day is Friday against James Madison, 5 p.m. The door is open. You see the man on the screen right there. He is the head baseball coach, Link Jarrett. Link, thanks again. It's great to talk to you again. I know you got to be very, very excited. I wonder, do you remember, not as a player, but perhaps your first opening day. Not as a player? Not as a player, just as a kid, a community, like first time. Because we, you know what I think, Link, if you love baseball, you'll remember this. I know you do. That first time that you walk through the gate and come down the aisle, any baseball park, the grass yeah. is so green. It's overwhelming. It's yeah. just, it, it captures your heart. Well, it was here for me. And my parents still live right up the road and we yeah. walked down here and it was a chain link fence. You just remember the bleachers. I think it was wooden bleachers, a chain link fence. Yeah. And like being up close to guys that were that physical when you're probably what, seven or eight years old and you're standing there and the proximity, I think it was ground level and you're basically looking at these guys, the lead betters and yeah. you know, some of the guys from back in, in that era that were so physical and so big and you're looking at it through that fence. That's what I remember. Uh, and it, my first recollection of baseball was, was right here. Home plate's probably in the same spot, essentially. What I think is cool about that, here we are, the moments at hand, Link, and um, I guess describe a little bit uh, your emotions. you got a job to do, I know, but it's got to feel a little sub surreal you think about for the for the folks out there listening, you were in June, uh, you know, uh, leading a victory over Tennessee and Knoxville on your way to the College World Series. Fast forward, you sit set to coach the team that you grew up watching. You just described that. Later on, became an All American as a player, and now you're at the helm, about to uh, embark on your, your your head coaching career at Florida State. That's that's got to be exhilarating. It's amazing when, when you think about it. I, I walked off the field last night and I was doing an interview in the coach's locker room. I'm kind of going, I'm sitting here in the coach's locker room as a head coach, you know, and I've rooted around this whole place. Now you're responsible for the atmosphere and, and the messaging of the program in this role. And I'm very excited. I, I really, Jeff, I want to get to the first inning of the game and get into the game. There have been so many parts of dealing with the transition for myself personally, coaching staff, and then those players have been through a lot. So you're ready for some of that to transition into competition. And that's that's what I'm most excited for. I'm I'm a little ready for some of the supplemental peripheral <laughs> stuff to end and go in there and have a really good first inning of baseball, get off of that field, into the dugout, and try to figure out a way to produce offensively. And then you do that over and over. And I'm really at that point in my mind of ready to relish and enjoy the competition. I think, you know, we talk about it with the players as, as you get further in your career. And, you know, one Seth Manus, our graduate assistant, pitched in the World Series. So when you can finally get to the field and get to the mound, I think that's where you're actually most comfortable. And that countdown is on. We need to have two really good practices. We'll practice tonight under the lights. We wanted the players to, to just sense that really for the first time this time of year. When we do have some new lighting, those the lights that shine up are supposed to provide. We got much brighter bulbs in some of those fixtures, so it should present a, a better ability to see the ball. So, you know, my checklist is almost complete, and I do want to get into that first inning and Carson Montgomery, let him ratchet that thing up and go get him and let's compete. I, I'm curious, do you get more, you know, players play and like you say, you get to the field, you go through your routine. Uh, they're usually habitualized and, and guys get ready to play. Once they're on the field, they're doing what they've always done. Do you get more nervous as a coach than you did as a player or do you get nervous at all anymore? Yes, you do get nervous. I, I think you want to just make sure the house is in order. Yeah. You know, and in my first time here, I, I want the game day experience to be very professional and if somebody gets to come to one game at Hauser Stadium I want that to be a great experience for that individual or that family I really do so some of the things that we've worked on all fall and all preseason lead you up to how you're going to do your your timeline countdown for game one and Bailey and Chip have been great Adam Ham these they have helped me so much but ultimately you want the experience to be a plus from the moment people enter the field until the last out of that game ends with hopefully 
a victory for us. So um, you you are nervous. I, I think it's totally different perspective on what your concerns are as a player, your physical capabilities and your game planning and making sure you're in tune with the competition is one thing, obviously pushing the right buttons as a coach and, and hoping, you know, the game day experience goes properly, but then putting the guys in position to win. And when you have to push buttons or you have to make personnel moves that, that you hope that you push the right buttons to give those guys ultimately the best chance to win. Talking with Link Jarrett head baseball coach, Florida state for those listening on air, not watching on war Chan TV. I would encourage you to do both. It's a young team coach. Uh, do, do you like that though? An opportunity, I guess, to instill from the start what you want them to be as ball players and student athletes. Well, yeah, Jeff, that's a that's an interesting concept. You know, you don't always know whether the young player that doesn't seem to have the experience at this level, like how sometimes that's just fine. All of these guys relative to us are new. So, you know, the, the canvas is somewhat clean in terms of our experience coaching them in games. So, uh, you know, the the fact that there's a handful of names that people recognize, I, sure. you know, whether that's good or bad, I don't know. I do like the names that everybody recognizes. You know, when you think of Ferrer and Crowell and Montgomery and Tibbs and Carry On and obviously Colton Vincent caught essentially every game last year. Like there are some household type names that are really good players. Then you have to mix in guys that people do not know. I did not know any of the guys other than the four games we played them last year. So then you put a, a Cam Smith in there, a Diamas Ross, um, McGuire Holbrook, who's one of our catchers. It's a little dinged up, but was a transfer from West Virginia. I think he will impact things as soon as he's healthy. That will be soon. Um, Jordan Taylor, Jordan Williams. There are some guys that have really – grasp what we're doing and have performed at a high level trait and rank we've moved him infield outfield he's an athletic kid that's had a really good back end of the preseason um, so I you know I like some of the new faces to you are no different than the guys that have been in the program <laughs> like to me so yeah, yeah. Um, Cameron Smith third base has been a phenomenal experience like he is moving to third and most of your elite infielders in high school play more shortstop and then some of them move and carry on is very savvy out there. We felt like the right thing for carry on and the team was to stay at short and Cam Smith, Jeff, when you, when you see this, uh, this is a six foot four inch, 225 pound, very elite talent. Now third base is a difficult position at any level, but when you make that transition from short to third for the first time, and you're having to deal with all the bunning and how the angle of the ball coming off the bat, it's different. It is different. When I did it, the perception of seeing the pitch ball from the middle infield, you could track that thing all the way to the plate. At third base, you, you can see the pitcher out of the corner of your eye, but you have to be a little more engaged with the strike zone itself and able to track the ball all the way. So we work a lot on just the angles and the reads and the different things that are unique to third base. But I think you'll find him very exciting. And Nander DeSatis, a, a face that was absent for a year, just he said, Coach, I, I please let me finish my college career at Florida State. And I was thankful we were able to, to get him back. And he gives us some depth and has done a nice job at second base. So I like, I, I like what's going on out there. And when you mesh all this together, essentially we've seen two groups of these guys kind of going head to head. And now it's time to, to try to mesh that and put them in a, in a competitive stance where they come out on top. Something that I observed in, in, in the way you answered that question, you weren't afraid to bring up Cam Smith. Anybody following college baseball understands who this young man is, is excited to see him play. His potential that you just described is something that people, if you're a Florida State fan, you're kind of salivating. Big, strong kid, all world in the state of Florida. People know of him. Do you worry about the pressure that comes with that? Obviously not, because you brought it up right away about what a talent he is. How do you handle freshmen with a lot of, uh, I, I guess, uh, aspirations and, and projections from others uh, on them? He's, he's just dynamic. And you, and you have to separate in college athletics the dynamic capabilities of a freshman 
from the fact that they are freshmen. So the lack of having been through this is real. The talent is real too. So finding my moments to coach him and try to bring him along and point out things that he did really well and point out things that clearly we need to improve on, they, there's that balancing act. Make no mistake that the talent and the potential is real. I mean, you, you will see it and it will not take long to realize that. Also, we must realize, you know, he's young and he has not been through this. So there may be some things that come up that are freshman-ish, even though the raw capabilities and the talent clearly are not. So it's that balance and in massaging and finding times to push him a little bit and making him feel confident, even if he has had some mistakes that that he has had to play through. So that's the managerial aspect of what we have to do with kids this age. As you pointed out, they're all new to you, whether they're freshmen or they've been veteran players on this roster. Quick question about that, then we'll finish up with the rotation and some other questions about the arms that we haven't gotten to. Um, you know, I mentioned this team was young. You're right to point out the veterans uh, of the nine position players who started last season's final game. We know only four remain, and you named those guys. But I am curious, I guess the question would be, how long does it take for players to – unlearn for lack of a better term and then learn a different approach if that's something that you're applying to them in other words how long does it take for guys to assimilate to the way you want them to play well i think when you get through two to three weeks of fall team practice now baseball has the unique calendar of you have the skill work segment so you're not out there with the team okay so you're with them but you're not scrimmaging and really competing and you're not out there for 18 to 20 hours a week. So I think once you've had two to three weeks of, of team practice, they start to understand what's going on. Now, it's not a complete package at that point, but I think their understanding and comfort with it and, and our comfort as coaches with what they're able to handle, that's, that's when you see it. And, you know, at that point, you're halfway through the fall. Then you're trying to figure out what each one of those guys needs from a technical standpoint. When you get back, we noticed, I, I noticed it at Notre Dame, I noticed it here. When you get back, there's a little bit of natural regression when those guys are gone for four or five weeks for Christmas break. So then you come back and the recall and the transmission of data, like you hope it's efficient and they they jump right back on board but there's things they're going to do at home to prepare um, but there are also things that they're probably not going to sit around the fireplace in the living room and go over the signs with their parents and grandparents like at christmas so there's certain things we know when we come back that we got to push the gas pedal in these areas physically you know they're working on their swing and their arm mechanics and getting themselves in shape so um, I know that's a that's a lot of information for your question, but there is that initial let's get it and that better take three weeks and then they start to get it. and then when you come back quick tune up and then you have to really be able to drive the car. Oh, that's great, Coach. More information, not less information. That's wonderful. We're getting this team familiarized for the fans and the stands. Speaking of which, the last time you talked about uh, this team, uh, you mentioned that you weren't real sure how you were going to utilize everybody yet. Have you carved out roles for these guys? Let's start with the pitchers, for example. The rotation going into the weekend, what you, what you see it as, and then also uh, whether or not you've got uh, carved out roles for these guys. And if not, two-pronged question. If you don't have carved out roles for everybody just yet, how long would you like that to take or before you realize, okay, this is what he is or this is how I'm going to utilize him? Jeff, very interesting. Probably the most demanding part of what we have to do as coaches and with the pitching staff. It is the most important and the most demanding maintenance that you have. We really built six guys in the preseason to get that pitch count up to 75 you know in practice now 75 in practice is a little different than when you roll out here and there's 5,000 people streaming those 75 pitches are a little bit different as real as we want to make practice I, I do recognize it's different so how do you balance who is going to essentially start the game and who seems to in weekend one we hope this is a 17 week deal 
in weekend one, we're looking at what gets the team out of the gate best in terms of who seems most logical to, with what we have, go open these games. And what do you have in leverage dynamic situations that allows you to escape if you need to, evade problems, and extend outings? So we really landed on Montgomery, Bowmeister, and Arnold to open these games. That leaves us Crowell, who is very, very dynamic and, and could easily start in May. But it gives an experienced leverage arm dynamic a chance to help us escape and evade and also extend because we built him just like we built the guys that essentially we determined would start these three games. Um, Connor Whitaker's in the same mold. Uh, Fields' his position, both of them, Crowell and Whitaker, really handle the run game, field their position. So when you put them in with traffic, like if they have to handle the ball, you know you have super athletic guys that are in the game if there is traffic. When the game starts, sometimes we may feel like we're in a jam, but there's nobody on base. So you do not have traffic unless it's self-inflicted. So the guys that start do get the opportunity to warm up how they won and enter a clean game. Those leverage guys, and I, I say leverage because in our game, th this, is, this is something that may take place in the fourth inning, the fifth inning. It's not always the last three outs. Sometimes those leverage situations allow you to escape so that you do have a game to win and compete in in the ninth. So we, we don't, by nature, hold somebody to just throw the ninth inning. When you look at the David Barretts, the Brennan Oxfords, we extended them, but we didn't extend them as much as, as the other group. Benny Barrett, big right-handed freshman, we extended him a little bit, not quite as much as Whitaker and Crowell, but he was extended. And then Dougie Kirkland is a, a live-armed right-hander. I mean, it's been mid-90s with a – Upper 80s breaking ball, um, been pretty good. And then Andrew Armstrong, we, like left-handed, good stuff. We have to get a little more out of him. So we start to script this out. But David Barrett in Oxford being David Barrett righty with upper 80s, 90-mile-an-hour breaking ball, and Brendan Oxford, the transfer lefty from Wake Forest, we feel like in short spurts, not necessarily match up, but you know, we, we did not build them to get to 70 pitches, but they're probably – capable of giving you 45 or 50 if need be. So that's how we scripted this for this weekend. I do not know, Jeff, how this plays out. Our job and our goal was to find a way to win Friday, win Saturday, win Sunday, <laughs> win this series. And that clearly to us was the way to go about it, to give everybody a chance to function in a role. I love it. Folks get a good idea of the process that you're going through as you figure out these roles that I asked about, and then also knowing that it's fluid, I'd ask you before we let you go, Coach, as we walk through the gates at Hauser and we get set for opening day, you already mentioned several of the starters, starters position players. Uh, I guess go through one last time, outfield, how you envision this. I know some of it's matchups always, depending on who the other team is going to start. Uh, but if you could, for the fans that are walking through the gates and they're filling out their scorecard, uh, what, are those, what does that position group look like to you? Well, it looks like you're going to have Jaime in right field. And we've spent a lot of time. I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you this. Like our, our stadium dimensions, you're confined in right field. And yeah. if you can have center field capabilities at Hauser Stadium in center field and left field, those are the areas that demand the most coverage. Right field is tricky, but you run out of room pretty quickly. We may go to some places where it's the other way. Like you go to NC State and left field is tight. So – his ability to play right field here, and but also not just be limited to right field will help us throughout the course of a long season. Um, Diamez Ross, if we're talking on pure center field and left-handed hitter and great base runner, he sure fits the mold in center field, and that's probably where we'll go. Um, Jordan Taylor, Diamez is a freshman. Jordan Taylor is also a freshman, and he's had a really good – uh, preseason those guys can both run Jordan Taylor can really when he gets underway and opens it up he can fly they both throw well I mean throws very well Jordan Taylor gets rid of it and you know it's it's coming out of his hand like it's shot out of a cannon no matter where you put him in the outfield um Jordan Williams switch hitter junior college player great baseball history uh, you know, he could play center 
He could play left or right, but but probably more left field right now. And I'll tell you, Trayton Rank has done a nice job of acclimating to the outfield. He's played some infield. We've moved him to the outfield. So he's a candidate in left field. And I, I think really right now you kind of have a three-way fight out there for left field. Um, Tibbs, also a very capable outfielder, but to get another runner in the lineup, we, we are trying to get Tibbs comfortable at first base. Good athlete. He could probably go play center field. But when you bring that type of athlete into the infield, the mobility, uh, kind of the range. I know first base throwing doesn't come into play a lot, but those three six ones and some of those pickoffs and the things that come up, it is nice to have somebody over there that can really throw, and he can. Yeah. Um, so we'll look at Tibbs. DeSatis looks to open at second base. Titan Kamaka has challenged and had a good fall as a freshman, but Nander's got that got that experience. He probably more than anybody he's, he's been through the SEC battles and clearly through the battles here. Carry on will play shortstop. Just love his savviness. And every day I'm around him, I, I, I taste that that baseball savvy and headiness that he has. It's really impressive how he navigates what's going on. And then Cam Smith at third and Colton Vincent will catch. And we do have some catching depth. One of the key pieces is is out. I told you Holbrook's dinged up right now. He'll be back. But, you know, Colton again, gosh, that guy caught about every inning last year. So you feel good. D.H., Cade Bush, Gunnett Carlson, one of the other left field candidates, whether it's Rank or uh, Jordan Williams, I, I, I kind of leave that DH to the last minute. I don't train, I don't like train somebody to DH. That's right. just a byproduct of trying to put the best defensive team on the field and see what bat is left. And the nice thing about the DH is it gives you some interchangeable parts without affecting the defense. So how you use the DH spot really gives you a little more flexibility to bounce guys around based on what's happening throughout the course of a game. Link, I wish you the best. Happy opening day, sir. Thanks for spending so much time with us. I know the fans appreciate it. I do as well. I wish you luck. I'll be talking to you throughout the season. Be well, good, sir. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate the time. All right. You take care.